Well, it's great to have you with us today and all our different locations. We're thankful that you're sharing your day with us. Whether you're at Pitt Meadows or Strathcona or Commercial or here in downtown Vancouver under the apex of the city skyline, we're glad that you're sharing your day with us. And we think that God's got something for you today in this message. Also, for those that are watching maybe on the internet or you're listening by podcast, excited to have you joining us. So let's give them all a real welcome that we're glad you're joining us today. God's got something special for you. You know, this past week I went down to a sandwich shop because... I'd heard from a number of people in the restaurant industry that they make one of the best sandwiches in Vancouver, and it's called bread and meat. And so I went down there, and I ordered this incredible chicken sandwich, and it really was as good as they said it was going to be. And I thought, wow, what an amazing sandwich. So tonight we're going to talk about sandwiches. I hope you've already eaten, you're not hungry today, because we're going to talk about sandwiches. What's your favorite sandwich? There was a poll done recently of, of favorite sandwiches. Just give me a shout out today. What would be a favorite sandwich here today? Anybody want to share their favorite sandwich? Chicken, all right. Peanut butter and jam. That didn't even make the list, I hate to tell you, but nonetheless, it is your favorite. Anybody else? Favorites? Salmon. BLT. That made the list. Montreal smoked leaf. Okay, that's good. Uh, Reuben sandwich, yes. The number one was turkey. Number two was ham. And number three was chicken. And there were veggie sandwiches were in there, all these different kinds of sandwiches. Now, when you order a sandwich, you typically order it by what's in between the bread. Right? You order, I'll have a turkey sandwich, or I'll have a veggie sandwich, I'll, you know, I'll have a, a tuna sandwich, or a BLT. It's really what's between the bread. You don't usually order, you know, I'll have a, a whole wheat sandwich, or I'll have a sourdough sandwich. But now you, you may specify the bread, but it's really about what's between the bread. Am I right? And so tonight, we're going to talk about what's between these two characters in the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter 3 and in John chapter 4. Two amazing characters. And John, not by accident, he takes and he sandwiches the most famous verse in the Bible between two characters. So, does anybody guess what it is? What's the most famous verse today? Somebody? You got it. God so loved. John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible. And he sandwiches it between... A guy by the name of Nicodemus and a woman, we don't know her name. And there right between is John 3.16. It's affected our culture today. If you walk just a few blocks from where we are, you'll end up on Robson Street, and you'll find a shop called Forever 21. How many have shopped at Forever 21? A lot of women putting up their hands, but not very many men. Guys, they actually have a very good men's section. (laughs) I shop there, believe it or not, because the price is right. And anyhow, when you you get a bag from Forever 21, we'll put a picture up. What's on the bottom of Forever 21 bag? John 3.16. Every Forever 21 bag has John 3.16 on. How cool is that? Now, if you go to California and you want a good burger, you go to Burger... Now, they don't have it in Canada yet. You go to In-N-Out. How many have had an In-N-Out burger? All right. The rest of you need a trip to California. Do a road trip. It's worth the road trip just to go to In-N-Out. All they serve is burgers, fries, and milkshakes. Very healthy restaurant to go to. But on the bottom of their cup, what's there? John 3, 16. It's this famous verse. Now, not only is it in the fashion world, the burger world, it's also in football. There is actually a game. You can Google it. It's called the 316 game. Happened in January 2012. There's a guy by the name of Tim Tebow. Remember him? He's making a comeback, I think. Tim Tebow on his eye blacks put on John 3.16. Now, in this particular game against Pittsburgh Steelers, he won it as a quarterback in overtime. 
The interesting thing they notice in, at, after the game is that he passed for 316 yards. His average pass was 31.6 yards. Somebody got on Twitter, and Twitter was going at 900 and some thousand tweets per second over this. It was breaking the records. It was the number one Google search that day, John 316. CBS got a hold of this, and they started looking at other stats. When the game was being watched, the peak audience was 31.6% of the U.S. households. And there was all these 31.6 stats. So CBS wrote in their newsletter, weird stuff, man, weird stuff. They didn't know what else to do with it. God had a way of using that to point people to this verse, this classic verse. That was a few years ago. It's also in country and western music. Now, I know we're not in country and western territory, but nonetheless, on the top 40 today, I think it's ranked like number 50, Keith Urban, married to Nicole Kidman, you'll recognize her name. He has a song out, and this is what it's called, John Cougar, John Deere, and John 316. That's on the charts today as we speak. I'll let you figure out what that title means, but... He's got John 3.16 in there. So this amazing verse is in our culture today. We want to look at it because it's sandwiched between two very different characters. So the first slice, the top piece of bread, so to speak, is Nicodemus. We put him on the top because he is upper crust. <laughs> Have you heard that phrase, upper crust? It's an old English term because they used to take the bread and they put it in this outdoor oven, this uh, brick oven, and the bread would burn on the bottom, but the upper part of the crust was the very best. And when guests came over to your house, if they were VIP, the most important person, you served them the upper crust. And so now if you're a somebody, you're called upper crust. Nicodemus, he's upper crust. He's... Educated, we know he's a master, he's a teacher, he's a member of the Sanhedrin. Doesn't mean much to us if we're not religious or are not familiar with the scriptures, but that's like saying he is on the Supreme Court. He's, he holds that kind of a position. He's powerful. Tradition tells us he's one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. So he's got money, he's got influence, he has, he's religious. He was a member of the Pharisees, and they kept every little rule there was, religious rule, they kept it. So if you wanted a, a picture of a man who was morally there, who, was, who managed his finances, who ruled in society, who had influence, it was Nicodemus. And we pick up the story in John chapter 3. So if you have your notes, just go to John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by what? By night. Now, he's a big deal. Why would he come to Jesus by night? Perhaps he came to Jesus by night because he wasn't so sure if he wanted all his friends knowing that he was hanging out with Jesus. Do you know we have people that sneak into the church after the service starts and leave before it's over? Or they'll, they'll, people will come because they don't want to be seen with the religious crowd or with a church group. Or they just, I'm not quite sure. So I, I just, I want a private audience. I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be noticed. And I think Nicodemus was like that. So I just, I want to talk to Jesus alone. I want to just spend some time with him and I don't maybe want the others to find out about it. Maybe there was a little bit of fear. We don't know all the reasons. But one thing we do know, in John's gospel, whenever he talks about something happening in the dark, it was in reference to a spiritual darkness. Nicodemus had all this going for him. Wealthy, had prominence, had education, he would have had several doctorate degrees, was on the Sanhedrin, but yet he was in spiritual darkness. 
Folks, you can have all the stuff in the world, all the degrees and everything, and live in spiritual darkness. This is a picture that John gives us of Nicodemus. He, too, would have to believe. Even though he had all this, he, too, would have to believe. And that's why I think he sought him out at night and asked him questions. He was interested. He, he wanted to believe. Ninety-eight times in this Gospel of John, he uses this word believe. He said, we must believe. We need to believe in the Savior. So he comes to him at night, and he says to him, Rabbi, which would be like doctor, teacher. It's a very respected term. He respects him. We know that you're a teacher from God, and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So our first piece of bread, the upper crust, is this aristocrat, this intelligentsia. This is Nicodemus. That's on top. What's the lower piece of bread? Let's find out who that is. The lower piece of bread is the woman at the well. And we find her story in John chapter 4. Sandwiched between is, of course, verse 16 of chapter 3. Now, it says in chapter 4 that Jesus had to go to Samaria. And uh, as he goes there, it's because he, I think, wants to meet this woman. And also, there are certain lessons that he wants to teach his disciples. There's lessons about the harvest. There's lessons about how do you treat other people that aren't from the same background that you are. So he has to go to Samaria. And there he would meet this woman at the well. Now, the Samaritans and the Jews, they did not get along. There was a lot of ethnic tension between these two groups. The Jews said that you can't make it to heaven. You don't even qualify. The Samaritans took the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. The Jews had the rest of the Old Testament. The Jews wouldn't eat with them. They wouldn't want to be seen in public with them. There was just a lot of tension between them. The Samaritans were half-breeds. They were a mixture of the northern tribes of Israel and the Assyrians, you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about how the Assyrians came in about 700 B.C. and conquered the northern part. Well, they intermarried with those people, and from that we have the Samaritans who came. And so there was this tension between them, and Jesus intentionally goes there. You have to understand the disciples would have been really uncomfortable. They were like, can't we go another way? Why do we have to stop in this town? He intentionally goes there. And Jesus would meet this woman when he stops at the well. He's journeyed 30 miles, stops for something to eat. Disciples go in town to get it. And while he's there, this woman comes to the well. Now, it's kind of unusual because that's not the normal time they would go and draw water. The well is Jacob's well. It's 105 feet deep, 9 feet wide. It was chiseled out by hand on a hard rock. It took a while to draw water from 105 feet. There's no little pump that pumped the water to the top, and there's no little handle to pump the water up. You, you pulled a bucket all the way up. It was a lot of work to get water. But the strange part is she's not coming in the evening when the rest of the people came. See, Jacob's well, that well would be like your Starbucks today. That's where everybody would go. That's where you socialized. In the cool of the evening, you'd say, hey, how was your day? How so-and-so? That's where the gossip was. That was the water cooler of the day. But what's strange is this woman comes by herself. Jesus is sitting there. She approaches. She's carrying her clay water jars. But this woman also has an incredible burden on her life. There's a sense of maybe rejection, embarrassment, guilt, whatnot, because she's alone. Others have maybe have distanced their, themselves from her, or she's distanced herself from them, but the rest of the women, women, they would have come at night. She's coming in the heat of the Palestinian sun to draw water, likely because of who she is, her reputation, the things that she's done in her life. And yet here, Jesus will engage her in a conversation. We read there in John chapter 4, verses 6 to 9. Jacob's well was there. 
And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with the Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Can you get the sense she's a little bit shocked? One, I'm a woman. You don't talk to me in public. Secondly, you're a Jew, and now you're asking me for a drink. This is really weird. Who are you? That's what's going through her mind. There's a real contrast between her and Nicodemus. Number one, we don't even know her name. Nicodemus, his name was known throughout town. He had 10,000 people on LinkedIn, okay? So everybody was, he was connected. She doesn't even have an account. She's, she has no, we don't know her name. She was a Samaritan, which means she was of a mixed race. She had a mixed religion, part Jewish, part pagan. She was a woman. In those days, it was culturally unacceptable to speak to a woman in public, especially if you're a rabbi. Some of the men wouldn't even talk to their wives and their daughters in public, let alone hear a rabbi, a teacher, talking to a Samaritan woman in public. Later on, when the disciples come back from going shopping, I don't know what they picked up. Maybe they picked up a sub sandwich. Maybe they picked up some Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's. We're not sure what they got, but they came back with something. And they were so shocked. They said, why? Why are you doing talking to this woman? They're, they're just, draw, jaw is dropped. They're, they're shocked. You're talking to a woman in public. Jesus, you have any idea what this will do to your reputation and our reputation? It was a bold move, Jesus engaging her. So that is, the upper piece of bread was who? Nicodemus. The lower piece of bread, the lower slice was? The woman at the well. Two contrasting people, characters. John did this on purpose. In between is this famous verse, John 3.16. So let's look at the verse. You probably know it off by heart, but we'll put it on the screen anyhow. Why don't we read it out loud together? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. This is the entire gospel distilled into one sentence. Somebody put it this way. A text that contains an ocean of thought and a drop of language. There's so much that's packed into there. If we look at it and break it down a bit, who loved? God loved. God loved. For God so loved. He didn't just love. He, he so loved. That speaks of incredible passion. He, he so loved. It's past tense. Loves. No, loved. He so loved. What does that mean? You'll find in other texts and other passages while we were yet far from him, he loved us. You know, it's easy to love your friends, easy to love your, you know, your family, but who loves their enemies? Who really loves a person that did them wrong? This is our God. He, he loved us. Well, we're far from him. He already loved us. He so loved what? The world. That represents everybody in the world. That he what? He gave. You know, if you love, you give. God is love. God gives. So he gave. He gave what? His only begotten son. That word begotten, interested in the interesting word in the Greek, it means one of a kind. Unique. The only one. There's not another begotten son. There's not another Jesus. He is the begotten one. The only one. Begotten Son, that whoever believes. Aren't you glad that there's a whoever here? Because today it includes all of us. It would include the upper crust and the lower crust. Include the upper piece of bread. The, it would include the Nicodemus, the elite, the aristocrat, the one who has it all. And also it includes just as much the person who's not even known. 
Whoever believes in him, in Jesus, should what? Not perish. God does, wants none to perish, but have everlasting life. Wow, no wonder that verse is so famous. Let's break it down a bit and uh, come up with a couple points here before we uh, wrap up. Number one, Jesus is a Savior for all people. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have. We all have this, as we heard way back in the first lesson on the story, that sin came in the garden. We were born into sin. How do you get rid of this? It came through Jesus. When he came into this world, was born in this world, there came our answer for sin. A few years ago, there was a company in, in the United Kingdom that came out with a very unique Christmas gift certificate. It was for mothers that were pregnant. And what it was is you bought this certificate, and uh, it, the, the company is called Smart Cells International. The certificate uh, is a, it's really basically a, a program where when the child is born, they take some blood from the umbilical cord and they'll store it for you. They're storing the stem cells. And they'll store it for the life of that child. And then later on, if the, that individual gets sick, they go back to those stem cells, which can, are known to help cure leukemia or, or they're fighting other diseases. And there's, they, they believe that as time goes along, those stem cells will help cure other diseases. But there's only one time, really, when they can take that, and that's when the child is born. The director of the company says, it's like, a, a light, it's like a insurance policy, but you only have one time to buy the policy, and that's when the child is born. God had a policy in mind for eradicating the greatest disease, which is sin. And when Jesus came to this earth, he came with something that would eradicate, remove sin out of our lives. You see, it doesn't matter if you are a wealthy, religious man in the community or if you're a person in your community who is basically an outcast. Jesus has come to take away the sin from everybody's life. He was born into this world for that reason. Secondly, Oh, boy, we have to get going here. Salvation is equally available to all by faith. In Romans 10, 12 to 13, it says, For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all those who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Nicodemus had come to Jesus, had presented to him this observation Nobody can do this unless they are. You know, God's been with them. And Jesus comes back to him and says, you must be born again. We've heard that phrase. You must be born again. Now, Nicodemus doesn't say why. He's not questioning Jesus, but he does ask the question, how? How is that possible? Can a person get back into their mother's stomach? And Jesus says, no, once you're born of the water... You when the woman gives birth, the water is born, but then you're also born of the Spirit. And when you're born of the Spirit, wow, that's when your spirit comes alive unto God. So he gives this explanation to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is still kind of like, I, I'm an educated man, but I, I'm not quite tracking with you. And Jesus said, it's, it's like the wind, you can see the effect of the wind. The trees are moving, the leaves are moving, the waves are coming in, but you can't see the wind. When someone is born again, you can see the effect in their lives. I might not be able to see Christ's spirit that came into them, but I can see they're not the same person. So he gives this explanation to this educated man, Nicodemus. For this woman at the well... We see that it's available for everybody. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus transcended all boundaries and showed that in Christ we're all one. Male, female, accepted or rejected, no matter what our social economic status is, no matter what our religious background is. 
when he comes to her, he says, can I have a drink? And she says, you know, why are you talking to me? And she talks about the well. He says, you know, I could give you water that you'd never thirst again. And she says, hey, I'd like some of that water because I'm tired of coming to this well. That really is a lot of work. If you got some water, I'll never get thirsty again. I'll have some of that, please. He goes, no, you don't understand. I'm talking about a spiritual water. It wasn't her natural thirst he was addressing. It was her spiritual thirst. She was so thirsty for relationship. She'd married five men. The guy she was living now with wasn't married. They were shacked up. She was thirsty for relationship, thirsty for intimacy with God, thirsty to be accepted, thirsty to be forgiven. All these things come through Jesus. At one point, she didn't know what to say, and she said, well, you know, we worship on this mountain, you worship on that mountain. Jesus said, the time is coming, now is, where you will worship in spirit and in truth. That great verse on how to worship. About that time, the disciples come back, and they're shocked that Jesus is talking to this woman at the well. And I think she saw their face, and she gets out of there. She leaves, goes back home, and she tells all her friends about what just happened. We can learn some things from her. She went back and told her friends, Jesus is worth sharing with other people. We read there in your notes, it's in your notes, John 4, 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. You know, it's interesting that at no time did she say to Jesus, Jesus, it's none of your business how many men I live with. It's none of your business. I, who, who are you, stranger, coming to our well, telling me how many husbands I've had or whatever? Who are you? And Nicodemus, he doesn't rebuke Jesus. Why? Because when you meet Jesus, and this is last week's message, when you see Jesus for who he really is, his eyes, his warmth, he didn't come to condemn the world, he says in this passage. I've come to save the world. Neither Nicodemus, this rich ruler, nor this woman, we don't even know her name, neither one of them felt condemned in the presence of Jesus, and nor should you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've gone through, no matter how much you have, he doesn't bring condemnation. Sometimes the poor, the unknown feel condemned. Sometimes the wealthy, the one who has things, they feel condemned. Jesus came to condemn neither, but to save all who call on his name. She went back and she told everybody. She went back into her town. Obviously, she was known by a few families. <laughs> and she said, hey, you got to come check this out. He's there at the well. They got him to stay a few days. Jesus was there with him. Now, Nicodemus, he also went. But his first encounter took a while before he shared with others. Yet when we read the end of John, guess who's buying the expensive anointing perfume and ointment to enwrap Jesus, to embalm him. It's wealthy Nicodemus. Another point in the Gospels, he stands up and defends amongst all those Pharisees. He stands up for Jesus. Sometimes those who are more upper crust, as we said in this example, who have a lot of influence in their community in that way, it takes a little longer for them to kind of come out of the closet and say, I'm a follower of Jesus too. But he does. Some, they have to process it longer. This woman, she was processed it quick. Ran, got her friends, come see this. It took Nicodemus a little longer. But both arrived at the same place. I wonder where you are in this picture. At this point, I'm going to ask, our campus pastors to come up and they're going to talk to each campus there individually about how you could respond to that. So as they're coming up, get your heart ready to respond to that. And then for those of us here tonight, just by a show of hands, how many here could relate to a Nicodemus? See, that would be more where I'm coming from. I, I could relate to Nicodemus, his approach, and th that would be more, I'm more like a Nicodemus. How many could say, that would be me? Okay. How many could relate? I'm more like the woman at the well. That, that would be me. All right. So yeah, we have different, but God loves us all. 
How many would say, you know, when I came to faith in Christ, you couldn't hold me back. I ran and told everybody, you got to check this out. I found Jesus at Alpha, or I got saved. You got to come check this out. Come quickly. I have found him. How many, you're just so excited. You told everybody right away, it's the next day. Okay. How many more like Nicodemus? It took a while. You had to process it. But, but you came through. It just took some time. And you came through and were great. You're a great supporter of the cause of Christ. I mean, it took a little longer. It took a longer process. See, it, it's, we, we're different. We arrive at the same place. What's in the middle is John 3, 16. Sandwiched between two very different characters. And tonight again, this message. We could hear this verse so many times that we've become familiar with it. But I want to put your name into it. For God so loved David. For God so loved Fari. For God so loved Cheryl. Or for God so loved Christine or Chris. For God so loved you. Put your name in there. He so loved you. So loved you. When you were messed up. When you were on your religious high and thought you had it all together, you were a big deal. But you were in darkness. Or you were messed up, went through multiple relationships and confused and hurt and broken and the pain of five divorces. How painful is that? But when you were there, he so loved you that he gave his only one of a kind, son, for you, the biggest price that could be paid, that if you would believe in him, you would never perish, but have everlasting life.